And that, that became more sophisticated and more intricate as time went on. But the fact is that it was always a brutal, cutthroat sort of business, that dangerous for the people that actually had to do the work, and, uh, and also very, very risky as a, as a business enterprise. That's why in Dr. Clark's book, Milltown, you can see a picture of people who are in the industry, and they're not really so much industrialists as just short-term, high gain, let's try this, and don't worry about that steam, about that steam equipment, because if it blows up, you know, we're all going to be out of business soon anyway. And that attitude, that attitude means that, well, that's kind of the, the melancholy conclusion to, uh, to Dr. Clark's book. As you see, the what's left uh, of the sawdust empire is, uh, is largely dust. Is that the, those people didn't leave even much for their own for their own kin to inherit because of the nature of frontier, of naked frontier, primitive, dead primitive extractive industry. And, and the story of the Ever Massacre has to do with that. But anyway, Charlie worked in a, in a shingle mill in the forks. And what he, what he really wanted to do was make movies. And I tell you, what he was, what he was intended to do here on this earth was make movies. If, if, this move, if, if this film you're about to see doesn't move you and also doesn't impress you with the skills, with the gifts of the man who made it, well, you know, we'll talk about it. The fact of the matter is, Charlie was a genius. And what he did here in one film uh, it is a lasting monument. We bought a copy and we worn it out. And now that it looks like it will be available in video soon. It should be, because it's not just about shingle weaving. Charlie's theme when he started to do this was to, to make a movie about work, about human beings and what they give up for the work they do and what they get back. And what that means, I thought shingle weavers were all victims. And then I saw Charlie's you know, They're not victims, they're heroes. But they're also every part of human character that you care to examine because the trait amplifies it. And you put pressure on the human beings and they show their best and they show their worst. And, and what Charlie did was to he found a stage in Forks for what, for what had impressed him as a young man just doing a summer job. And what he left was a monument to a trade uh, that now I think all of us, you can't see this movie without being a little bit more in awe of the whole idea of what, is what was done by, by the average shingle mill uh, Sawyer at the very least. But, uh, but the fact is that Charlie, Charlie and we didn't realize that, that delightful couple of days we spent with him uh, arranging to uh, purchase a copy of his, of his film, that that was going to be a real short, uh, uh, real short friendship. Uh, uh, he was killed in, in an auto accident, uh, a, a drunk driver, I believe, sideswept his motorcycle. And, uh, uh, and that was the end of uh, Charles Gustafson's career as a filmmaker. A, a, real, a real tragedy, uh, uh, a tragedy, a lost artist. Uh, someone with remarkable gifts, and uh, I don't have to just keep saying it. You're going you're to see a film that I think you can find so was really worth the time. Uh, a lot of us are documentary film addicts, okay, we'll admit it, but this is a marvelous, poetic, eloquent film in which Charlie Gustafson has left you a picture of what, she, of what a shingle slayer is all about and what the shingle trade was all about. Uh, and uh, I can't wait to see it again. Yeah, thanks, David. The uh, we got permission to show this film from the Evergreen State College, who, along with the family, owns the copyright on it. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to show it today uh, in a in an auditorium like this. But. Uh, they tell me, we've been in, con uh, in contact with a guy down there who made this DVD version we're about to see, uh, which is uh, uh, much better than the 16mm film we had, which was not only the color was going off, but it was a pretty rough uh, film after all the times it had been shown. So at some point, we think uh, that, that that film will be available on DVD again and might be gettable. So right now it's not.
don't know about you guys, but I, I was looking at people's hands for weeks after watching this video. <laughs> and uh, if you notice, uh, the Gustafson's fingerprints are all over this thing. He even played the art synthesizer somewhere in that film. So, quite a, quite a deal. Uh, but now I want to bring on uh, a special treat. Uh, thanks to Janice Ohio for pointing out that Bill Marcatel was a working shingle weaver. She talked to him when she was making her film Corona. And so we called Bill up and, and I sent him a copy of the film cuts. He hadn't seen it before. And he seemed to be about as floored as I was by seeing it. And uh, I asked him to come here and talk a little bit about cuts, introduce himself, and uh, talk about the film and talk about shingle weaving and entertain any questions that you guys might have after seeing this film. Uh, I'll let him largely introduce himself. He said he was a working shingle weaver up near Concrete until about 1988. And uh, then he's opened his own business, Marcantel Shingle, which is still going today. So. Uh, please welcome Bill to Park and Tell. Shingle and concrete. 
And the dairy machine mill where I started, the big six machine mill was done and gone and scrapped out. I got to thinking, well, if I'm going to keep doing this, which is all I ever did, so it was like, if you're going to continue doing this, you better get you a shingle machine and put it in somewhere so you can stay working. So that's what I did. And I went and bought me a shingle machine at uh, Le Connor Shingle. I was went on this channel in Le Connor. Put it in at the house in 1988. I've been working for myself ever since. Doing just what you see right there. Except at a slower pace now. <laughs> These guys, I mean, I'm familiar with all that because it was all piece work back in them days. You, the more you got, the more you, money you made. And it was like, it was almost like competition. When you went to work in the morning, it was just like, not only was you there to make money, but you was also wanting to beat everybody else on the amount of square you got that day. So, you know, the high, the more you got, the more you got paid, naturally. But it was also the idea, just like winning any, at anything else. You just wanted to be the high man for the day on the shingle company. Then it was just like a bunch of race car drivers or anybody else that was competition. So that was fun. I mean, it, I can't look back on it. And any of my years working, I always enjoyed it. It wasn't never nothing I dreaded to do. Back in the days when you seen the kind of wood they was cutting in, it was almost fun to go to work. Just to cut them big yellow old shingle blocks all day, one behind the other. And nowadays, I wish I had any of that wood left. There's nothing to be got like that. Long. So anyway, I've been working for myself for, what, 20, 28 years? <laughs> About time to quit, when you think. <laughs> <laughs> but that's pretty much the end of that. That's what I've always 22 years of working for other mills, 28 years of working for myself. It wasn't just what you see them guys doing back right here. Grabbing shingles and trimming them and making shingles. <laughs> it to me it's just like anything else you do. It was like people that come up and buy shingles, they want to see it run. What in the world would make you stand behind that and want to make a living? I said, I don't know. It's just to me, it's like you getting in your car and driving off. I don't more have any fears when I'm up there. It's just like I'm daydreaming about other things or not even really worried about it. It's not something, once you do it for that many years, you just lose your fear of it, I guess. It's like getting in your car and driving off. It's pretty much a valid guess. But it's what I still do. So, anybody got anything you want to ask me about? Yeah. Do you fire the shingles? I don't know. I just sell a raw season. And, and the reason I ask the question is because isn't there an insurance issue regarding the use of shingles? Oh, it depends on the town you're in and the codes and the. There's a lot of states that won't buy or allow shingles to be put on the roads anymore in California, Texas, and pretty much everywhere they got a real dry climate, they don't allow cedar unless it's been a part of I just had to strip off the cedar shingle roof in Montana. Couldn't get the farm commercial or the forest service to accept it. They didn't want you to pay the bag. Sorted every single shingle I took off and gave the people one of the projects because they're just so beautiful. Even when they're all together, I can't do it. Well, that kind of country, they last forever. They yeah. should. Yeah, around here, they grow up pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> they don't last like that here. But in a drier climate, they'll last for a long time. Jerry Heichel, a friend of mine, he's a contractor. He bought a lot of shingles from me. He knows about how long they'll last on the roof, I guess, maybe 25 years. I've had them on my roof 25 years, and we're still going to have them treated. So. Not treated, you know. <coughs> have you looked into, uh, or you, you, they will last forever here if they're on the side of the house? Sidewalk, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, are they still available all the time? Some old growth? 
So, salvage. You get you can get old drugs, but it's so limited amount anymore. So, like me, what I do is I work for myself, and I don't push myself. Most people know that. <laughs> I might work an hour or two behind that tree in the in a day. And then some days I don't feel like working, I don't work. But it depends on if I got an order to cut. And people do still prefer overload. Mm -hmm. But get it. You can get a limited amount from various places, private land. You can't get any off the federal government, you can't get any off the state. Department of Natural Resources, they don't allow no oil growth to be, even have a timber sale, they don't yard in oil growth. Leave it for the boat. So, you get a little, but enough for a little small guy like me to run. But if you had a production mill going like this, no. There ain't no way. Not any more that. What's the difference between the oil growth? What's the quality that makes the oil growth better? Than what do you use today? Sidewall, most of the shingles I cut are sold for sidewall, 90% of them. Very rarely to get anybody out there for a roof shingle. Because the roofs have went to so many other products nowadays, they got away from cedar. Not all of my shingles that I cut go for siding. And it really doesn't matter if it's a second roof or old roof. I mean, if you're going to put it on the sidewall and put stain on it, paint it, or whatever you're going to do with it, it's going to see very little weather, so probably last forever. Long in your house, or whatever you got, yeah. Yeah. When we ever hear, I believe, reported in 1990 that sports had a huge spike in domestic violence following the federal uh, spotted owl legislation that shut down the forests. And uh, every community college criminal law instructor, retired New York cop, said that there were a lot of people who in order to keep their land, they went into some illegal production of uh, illegal uh, substances. And how, how, much, how, how much of the available timber that mills had were, uh, was cut off from them? Was it like 80% or 95%? Why was there this huge spike in domestic violence? <laughs> That's a question I can't answer. I don't, I don't have any idea why that would happen. My cousin's a doctor who works in my other cousin who runs the septic system. So because of the lack of cedar created. Well, what about the spotted owl legislation did to shut down the forests from the mills? Yeah. I don't know about that. Angry people no idea. couldn't make enough money. <laughs> they were used to working in the I guess it was people out of work resorting to other ways to make a living. I don't know. And a lot of, a lot of the old timers were getting drinkers. So, what about other health issues? Because they couldn't work. Right. What's that? What about other health yeah. issues from the dust and the noise and so forth? <laughs> yeah. I noticed this movie was made in about 73 or 75, just about the same time. 79. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, Nixon signed the uh, Occupational Safety and Health Act in the mid-70s. And I wonder if there were machine guarding standards coming in <laughs> after that at some time. It was always pretty much up to the mill workers as to whether you wanted to wear safety equipment or whatever. There was a forced thing, and that's why I came here. <laughs> But well, that's true. Well, you're also married. So. Back in the <laughs> late 60s, early 70s, 80s, when I was working, it was like nobody wore your protection. It was like you looked down the aisle and nobody else was wearing it. Why should I? Mm -hmm. It was just, I don't know, it was stupid, but we didn't. And we're paying for it now because it came here. But, in the, there never was really a requirement that you had to wear anything. Mm -hmm. Later on, if you decided you wanted to protect what you had left, you wore goggles and hearing protection. But there was never any forced issue about it. 
Just up to the HM and Mitchell, whatever you want to do it. So you didn't see modifying machines to comply with access standards? Because I know the book on machine guarding, you know, size of the phone book. The guard in front of them? Yeah. There never was really any. When you okay. put up much of a guard on a machine, huh. it pretty much has to be open right. to cut wood. And if it's open to cut wood, it'll cut you. Yeah. I mean, there wasn't any way to put any guards on it. Gotcha. Got some uh, shingles that uh, goes no, away. Uh, right there. There's no on the side of the chair. Uh, you guys can pass those around. Oh, the 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 I never really had any trouble from the side of it. I mean, I really like it. Uh, this is. Uh, never did develop any of the bodies or lung problems from it. Besides the one I'll let you make it here. If it would kill you, I'd be dead. I'd breathe it out of it. I don't know. It would probably have something wrong with it. It never did bother me. Some people, I think some people that probably would affect them. I never did. Grady feel I couldn't quite see the exact distance your hands against the trouble. You can chill closer and against the left side. It should. Yeah, the saw blades running under your hand up like if the teeth are right here, the shingles are coming off that blade and the pants are right here. You're about three or four inches away from the teeth. It looks farther away on the filter. It seems to be that's all right. You're right there. Yeah. This is always fingers that I got cut. I didn't cut them off, but I've had the high score on them. Yeah. Way more than once. You know, the shingle don't cut off and it saw the drag it back. And your first instinct is to grab for that finger. Yeah. Then that about to hurt your hand right in the cheek. And I've grabbed my hand more than once and waited for a while to look at it. Because <laughs> <laughs> initially what you get is like somebody just takes your hand and gets it with a hammer. And then you you grab it and you're grabbing the look at it. Yeah. You think, well, this is it. I've got it now. Yeah. And you look at the ragged bunch of gloves with gloves. Yeah. You ease the glove off and look. Oh, they're still there, but the eyes tore off a good for them, but at least they're still there. I've been out of work for a couple months at the time because of healing up and healing back up. Never missed the fingers gone, but I've had them. Raggedy like that. Are there any situations where things get slippery where you lose your grip on the gun? Is it sap or oil or anything? No. Not so. It sort of stays dry. Yeah. Because it's dripping against the water. Yeah. Some of the old timers talked about uh, differential in the RPMs is the saws when they brought new other saws online. Operating an individual machine is probably a lot safer than. Pretty much a single machine was always the standard. They're all the same as far as the way they're built, the way they run, and the speed. But people used to like to speed them up because of production. If you're getting paid for every square, you want to cut as many as you can. So what they would do would be put tape on the arbor to build it up so that the uh, speed turns about faster. And instead of standard 32 clips, I've seen them running 40 clips, 42 clips, which is too fast. Because then you're, you're pushing it in. 32 clips is perfect, you know, for keeping up with it. Yeah. What, what was your typical day like? How, how many hours did you work? When did you start? When did you finish? What were your... Um, Great times, and uh, how much were you paid, and were there benefits involved, and things like that? Back in the day, when I started in '66 in the mill, the union was strong. Every mill was union, and it was a six-hour day. Then you had an hour and a half of work, then you had a ten whatever minutes you felt like taking a break, and you'd go back to work and work the rest of that three hours. And then you had lunch. And you had half hour to 45 minutes lunch, depending on the meal. Then you'd work another hour and a half and take a break. So you had 
six hour day, which you actually worked about five hours and 45 minutes, stuck roughly up behind the machine. Now before that, they was eight hour days, and then before the union, way back from these guys, were, all this was going on down here on the waterfront for trying to get a union established and working hours. I heard that they work 10 hour days. So to me, that's way too long behind the chain. <laughs> you can see at the pace they're working, you know, you don't, you, it's not feasible to keep up with something like that for 10 hours. Because by the time the last few hours coming around, you're getting pretty run down. Probably it's when most of them got cut, I don't know. That's why they need the whiskey. <laughs> yeah, that's why they drink the whiskey. For making it through the day. I, don't know. I never worked them kind of days. I mean, I could see after a six hour day, I was enough. When you stand there for six hours doing that, you put in a day. Yeah. Did the union make any efforts to improve the safety for Aside from shortening the, the work day. Other than shortening the days down to a amount that you could work and not, you know, get over and work. No, really wasn't much the union did, except for we did have holidays, vacation, medical. So, so nobody tried to re-engineer the way the worker worked in order to make it safer for the work. There wasn't much you could do. Machine on machine was pretty cut and dry, as you've seen them. Well, and they never have changed them. They've been the same since. Was it, was it all one machine, the one that did the slicing and then the one that did the chipping, I guess is what you called it? Was that, was that all one machine? Well, it was one was machine, but you had two saw blades. You had the big saw blade, you the last one, and you had the other saw blade that you did your trimming. It's all one machine, it was one unit, but you had two blades running. What, what percentage of the workers did you say were union? With what? Were union workers, all of them, or? Well, back in them days, everybody was union. Because all the mills I worked in in the 60s were union. Did, did the people who owned the timber ever think of working with the union and maybe even slowing production down to make it safer so that what, so they could work on the same paradigm that the oil companies were working on? Okay. Don't pull that stuff out of the ground so fast that there's a, a surplus. Don't, all those trees so quickly. I don't know. I think, <laughs> I think back in them days, if people just looked at the extract of this resources the like they were never going to end. And that's why you had so many big production mills running three shifts a day, cutting out thousands of squares a week. I mean, I don't I still to this day don't know where they sold all the machines. <laughs> Even for me, no more than I cut, it's hard sometimes to sell them. I mean, you just go for weeks without a phone call and you want to run. Back in the day, how many squares would you cut in a day per person? When I first started, when the wood was just what you saw in that movie, nice big cube, six hours, you could cut 30 to 35, even 40. There, Depended on the sawyer. Some sawyers you cut 40 square a day. My wife, that's where I met her and married her. She was 19. I was sawing shingle and she was fun of them at the Darrington Shingle Mill. And she was working for an old shingle sawyer who was quite a bit older than I was at the time. His name was Mickey Melvin. I don't know if anybody in there has ever heard of the guy. But he was an old shingle sawyer that worked all over Everett and everywhere else at the time. He would cut, what, 40 to 45 square and six hours. Oh, he was fast. <laughs> hey, Bill, could you explain what a square was for everybody? A square is four bundles of whatever the grade. You've got one, two, and then you got a three and a four. The square is four bundles of shingles. So you're talking 40 square would be 160 bundles. In a six hour day. How many pieces? More or less. Pieces? Yeah. How many pieces in the bundle? Uh, I can't. Any guess? I, I don't know. It's a little, it adds a little over 100 shingles a bundle. That's about right. Depends on the width. You've got various widths. You've got narrow ones, you've got wide ones, but if you're average, 
probably a hundred pieces per bundle. Somewhere in there. A square cover is ten by ten. What's that? A yeah. Square cover is ten by ten. Yeah, ten foot by ten foot, one hundred square feet. However long that is. Can you tell me what lap is and what lap is? Did you cut that up in the Is that ever? LATH lath. That's a board. Oh, I think it's lumber. And they pack it and they, they pack it like shapes. Um, but I'm not sure about that. I think it's a lumber pan, Jerry. It's a lath. It's a armature. It's a. Like I think you use like the board and bat siding. Right. Well, I use it, basically use it inside the house. You pack it up and then they put a scratch over on it. And then it's finished. It's a different one. This change is the same. It's a lumber division. Yeah. Okay. Something I never was around. Oh, scrap all of it. Yeah. Uh, so, is there anything that you're looking back that you can learn about uh, teach us for the future us that maybe are having some conundrums in their own search for work or keeping work or a system that seems to steal um, test our morals for the environment and some of us for the money that seems to play it? You know. What do you okay, so all that old growth is being cut down. You have to go 55 miles to get the Yukon Age Park to, to hug one of these guys. Right. I got a tattoo because of that, that last red cedar out there in Fort. It's it moved me so much. It's still out there. You can tell everything was mowed down all around it, and that one tree sitting there. We have worked. Uh, we've lost our hands, our limbs, some of us our minds. There's people out there homeless. Some are in here for shelter right now. How can we as a society learn from what's happened for this in the future, for us not to continue, maybe for us to, to get more power and say, look, slow down production. Maybe. We're not learning from history. We're not learning from history. Too late. Because now we've got to take the power. They've already bought it all down. I mean, you can't throw it back. The trees are growing now. What I call second, and if, if you're in a business of blogging or whatever, you got old growth, you got second growth, and even third and fourth growth. But we'll call it second growth. It's the regrowth of the new trees that come back since they logged the old growth off. Well, they're anywhere from 12 to 20 inches through, and that's what they're pretty much making all their lumber out of now. And if I'm cutting shingles, I'm cutting a lot of second growth, which is the coarse grain. It's a different species of wood. It's not even the same. They call it red cedar, but it has a different smell and has no oil content or lasting. I don't know what made overall what it was. I don't know. It had higher oil content, finer grain. I don't know. It was just something that's been here forever, but they cut it all down, so it's never going to go back. What they had, the stumps that showed in the movie, the millions of acres of it that they mowed down. So it was just something that they did. I mean, they had the mills to take care of it and they cut it up, and they did it. And it's gone. I think it was all about money. They wanted to take it all. Uh, bigger and more, and how much can we? That in a day, and, you know, build another bill that would get the two ships, let it run free. It was that type of mentality back then. Just cut it up. It's like they shot all the buffalo. It was the same thing. But they didn't care. So, yeah, I could still keep cutting all the roast cedar today if they left. <laughs> so, anyway, it's, a, it's an occupation that kind of I look at it like it's the end of an era. It was what it was. It was a big boom. Everett was pretty much built around shingle mill, lumber mill. And it was a time that was here and it's 
winding down the work. I'm the last one of the last guys even knowledgeable about it that knows anything about it. Mm -hmm. Pretty much gone. So that's why I'm here today. They couldn't find anybody else. <laughs> big mill on the waterfront of all the big mills that was there. Yes. I was just a kid, I was only 18 or 19, I can't remember, but I was going to go to work there anyway. Does it say what date yeah. it was? 8th of August, 1967. that's what I thought. See, I was only 19. Yep, 1967. So, I was supposed to go to work there the next morning. It might be machines upstairs. Yeah, that's a shame machine. Is that a single machine? Oh, there's a bunch of them in there burning. This is the James. See them all lined up Why is it burning? There. Hmm? Why is it burning? It caught fire. The old mills, that's what happened to most of the older mills. They caught fire and burned because of the wood. they just old, made out of old dry lumber. And, sawdust and it didn't take much of a spark to get them going and mm -hmm. once they got on fire there wasn't enough stopping them yeah that's what happened to pretty much all the big mills they just burnt from a electrical short or who knows back then people smoked cigarettes and worked and threw them down and squished them out on the floor and, you know i've worked in all them places where the shingle sawyers would be standing there sawing with a cigarette hanging out of their mouth you know what i mean mm -hmm. there was a <laughs> much said about it back then. It was an attitude that everybody smoked. Everybody smokes. <laughs> Even the mill owner smoked. So I mean, yeah. you know, he, what's they he going to say? Took a cigarette, but they did like that in the everybody room. smoked. <laughs> TV ad was full of <laughs> cigarette ads. So Jason, can you tell me about these uh, uh, buttons here? Okay, I brought in my collection of Shingle Weavers Union pins. I've got three from Everett, one from 1937, oh one from 59, and one from 1960. Wow. And I've got uh, one from Olympia from that local, one from Kalama, one from Centralia. Mm -hmm. And I've got six Oregon and Washington district pins from 1941 to 45. Yeah. And then I've got some more on this upper row here that only give the local number of the union, and I haven't identified what town area they're from. Where did you get them? Um, most of them have come off eBay, and then I've gotten some from uh, antique dealer friends that have them. And you said 20 years of collecting. Yeah, about 20 years I've been looking for these. And any kind of shingle mill postcards I'll buy, especially from Everett. Uh, brought in some postcards of the old waterfront showing the mills on 14th Street dock. That some guy had it. And I've uh, got a, a branded shingle from the Jameson Shingle Company. Oh, a branded shingle, what is that? Um, before they used paper labels, they would yeah. take a stencil and lay it over each bundle of shingles, and then they had uh, an ink with a brush, and they would stencil the, oh, yeah, the name of the company uh, onto each bundle of shingles. So this one, someone must have been tearing a roof apart and found it in there, and then I bought that off eBay from out of California. Okay, so I'm going to move my camera here. Oh, sure, I'm sorry. Sure, sure. Um, so now tell me, once I get this settled, I'm going to cut all that out, you understand. <laughs> there we go. Now, what else do we see in this case? In this case, I've got a postcard of the Sumner Ironworks. 
in their original location, but was on the east side of the Snohomish River by the trestle. And uh, a tag from a part with their name on it. They were in business from 1892 to about 1960. This plant burned in 1913 and they rebuilt over in Lowell and that building is still there. And I've got a letterhead from Sumner Ironworks from 1905 that was uh, a bill to Agnew Hardware for some machine work they did on some bolts. And then the other cards in this case are of the bicycle tree in Snohomish. That's no longer there. It blew down in a storm in 1928. Hmm. And then there's another tree they just called the bicycle tree, but it didn't have an arch you could ride bikes through or anything like that anymore. Why do you uh, include that picture in your collection? Um, just to show the size of some of the cedar trees that Those used to grow trees. around here. Yeah. They used to be this a bigger tree as well. here is at the rest area north of Smoky Point now. It's been moved a couple times. And uh, it's on display there still. Thank you. So let's look at your next, uh, what you have. You have right. some shingles here, right? These are bills. Bill, you brought some shingles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my wife decided that she thought they could. I think she talked to them and see that they didn't have any here, so she thought she could. Good and idea. That little miniature bundle was produced by somebody way back in the whenever, I don't know. Somebody built a little scale shingle machine that would cut small shingles back to when, I don't know. And they put out them bundles, and the bureau was giving them out for souvenirs to the mills, so the inspector would bring around a bundle to every mill and give them to them. And then they uh, got scattered here and there, and we wound up with that one through somebody. I can't remember well, how I got Well, a friend of mine that worked for me, her aunt, her aunt's father was the old inspector that, that made that machine and saw those shingles, and she had one of the bundles left, and she said, well, I can't think of anybody that needs that more than Bill, so she gave it to him. Good for her. <laughs> yeah. I wish they'd have the machine, but... <laughs> Thank you, Jason. I appreciate yep. it. It's good talking to you. Um, okay. Thanks. Yeah, I worked at that mill.